A fifth common Christian teaching is the doctrine of original sin. And I like to say, in the case of John and Charles Wesley, the doctrines of original sin and original righteousness together. Now, the basic implication of this teaching uh, is human beings cannot save ourselves. We are not capable by ourselves, by our natural uh, powers and abilities to do what is good. We are not capable of turning to God. We are not capable of believing in Christ. We are not capable, listen to me very carefully, we are not capable of free will, and we do not have free will on our own. Yes, Methodists are going to make a case for free will based upon a gift of divine grace, but not on ourselves as we are. And the implication of preaching about original sin is that you need to come to the point where you acknowledge your need for God. Uh, repentance is not simply saying, dear God, I did this and I did this and I did this and I'm, I'm officially sorry about that. It's saying, I need help. I cannot change myself. I need the power that comes from outside of myself. I need that amazing grace of God that is able to change me. That's what the doctrine of original sin is all about. We know that John Wesley had some private and uh, in some ways publicly stated reservations about one aspect of the traditionally Western doctrine of original sin. That was the idea that every human being, um, not only the idea that we're born into a screwed up world and somehow sin and evil are going to infect us along the way, but it was the idea that we inherit from Adam and Eve and through subsequent generations of humans the guilt that Adam and Eve incurred as a result of their disobedience to God. Uh, the way that was traditionally stated in the Anglican Articles of Religion was to say that in every person born into this world, original sin deserveth God's wrath and damnation, which is to say, if God is just, if God is fair, then every human being will be damned to hell eternally because of what our first ancestors did. John Wesley had some questions about that. He sometimes expressed reservations uh, in private letters, like uh, a letter that he wrote uh, to a Dr. Mason. But when he came to revise that article of religion to send to the North American Methodists in 1784, he left out those words so that original sin, he says it, referring to original sin, deserveth God's uh, wrath and damnation in every person born into the world. So John Wesley may have had questions about that. He may have left the, mm, the question of the inheritance of guilt open. But nevertheless, I would say John Wesley has a traditional sense of original sin in the basic sense that sin infects all of us, evil infects the whole world, and we cannot by ourselves, without the gift of God's grace, we cannot do good uh, and justify ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. We all need God's grace. I think that's the kind of cash value meaning of the doctrine of original sin. And John and Charles Wesley also emphasized God's original righteousness, the original plan that God had for human beings and that God will restore in the end through sanctification. A sixth common Christian teaching is the doctrine about justification, as it's stated in its classically Protestant form, justification by faith alone. John Wesley describes justification as a change in our relationship to God when we come into a right relationship with God on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, it is by grace alone. It is not by our own goodness or our own uh, choice by ourselves. It is only by a choice that is prepared by God's grace. It is uh, by faith. It is not by simply intellectual assent to a set of truths or to a creed. Uh, it is by our trusting in Jesus Christ as the one who has the grace, the one who is able to do 
what we need for our salvation and indeed has done what needed to be done for our salvation. That's classic Protestant material, and if you look at the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification that the Lutherans and Catholics agreed to in 1999, and to which the World Methodist Council became a signer in 2006, uh, you will see that Methodists have a great deal of resonance with the ecumenical consensus that has emerged on that issue in the last uh, two decades. A seventh uh, common Christian teaching that John Wesley affirms is the doctrine of the new birth or regeneration. Uh, re in Latin means again, generatio is a word for birth, re generatio means the new birth. That means we are not only forgiven of our past sins, but we are born again to a new life in Jesus Christ when by faith we trust in Christ. Uh, John Wesley could say that our justification and uh, our regeneration may begin, typically begin at the same moment. I sometimes use a coin, hey, that's a guitar pick, but we could say one side of that coin or guitar pick is the death to the old life, uh, the forgiveness of our previous sins, uh, and the other side is being born to a new life in Christ, when uh, through faith in Christ, God begins to change us, to change who we actually are, uh, and that process of sanctification, of growth and holiness, begins at that same moment. What is that moment? Now here's a point where we've had a lot of uh, historic disagreement between Wesleyans. John Wesley made it clear that our new birth occurs when we are baptized in the first place. He actually says this about himself in his account of his Aldersgate Street conversion experience. Uh, he begins that account by saying, I believe it was not until I was nine or ten years of age that I first sinned away that washing of the Holy Ghost that was given me in baptism. Uh, in later life he would say, you can't trust that slender reed of baptism but, he goes on to say, but it is clear that our church teaches that those who are baptized are born again. What he really referred to there was a, a prayer in the Book of Common Prayer where a minister, having just baptized an infant, says a prayer of thanksgiving, uh, Dear God, we give you thanks that this infant is now regenerate of thy Holy Ghost. This infant has now been born again by the Holy Spirit. John Wesley held very consistently to that, that when we are baptized, even as infants, we are justified and born again. And yet, he believed that most people fall away from that justification and regeneration that's given in baptism, and they stand in need of, the way I say it is, being born again, Again, John Wesley was not unique in that. Uh, Lutheran and Reformed pietists had argued uh, along the same line, and it's become a standard part of evangelical Christianity to emphasize that even if you've been baptized, you still need to be converted uh, for yourself. Make your own decision. Uh, that's very much part of the ethos of evangelical churches, including historically Wesleyan churches. I'll come back to that a little bit when we talk about baptism.